Hi, I'm here with Michael Granovius uh, with Ericsson, uh, and today we're talking about transport and more specifically talking about uh, front hall transport. Hi, Michael. Uh, welcome. Good to see you today. Thank you for having me. Great. So we've got a good discussion uh, on uh, front hall. So, you know, as we think about uh, transport networks uh, historically, we've always had the back hall network was packet focused. Get into Correct. 4G, we, we moved into front hall, but the front hall was not a packet network. Now, of course, with 5G, we're seeing a big focus on packetized front hall. Um, can you just, you know, start by talking a little bit about what's driving that uh, evolution to packetized front hall networks? Sure. Um, we see four key drivers. The first one is the new enhanced CPU interface, eCPRI, which is a packet interface, and that's really the enabler. It scales with the use of traffic, and it's up to 10 times more efficient compared to the current TDM CPU interface. And because of this packet base, it also allows for uh, statistical multiplexing. The second one is convergence and lower costs. It allows you to build a single unified packet network for both your fixed and your mobile traffic, supporting a wide variety of traffic, not just eSIP prefrontal, but also F1 mid-toll, backhaul, any coordination traffic, in addition to your fixed enterprise services. The third one is programmable network. It allows you to evolve your network much easier without having to repatch fibers. Uh, the radio access network is not static, right? Uh, we keep on adding more capacity, more radios to it. And having a programmable network allows you to point any radio to any baseband or virtual digital unit. What brings me to the final fourth point is it is enabler for cloud RAN. It allows you much easier to migrate to cloud RAN architecture where you take the packet front interface and connect it directly where you have the virtual distributed unit running on. So it's another tool in the toolbox. Uh, we had passive optical frontal, we have active optical frontal, we have microwave frontal, and now we also have packet frontal. Right, there, there's certainly a lot of options. And so, you know, we always talk about front hall in the context of 5G, but of course, front hall did, did uh, come out and rolled out, especially in North America and in other regions as well, uh, for 4G networks. And so there's a lot of CIPRI uh, installed base. And so now we're moving to, you know, the packet front hall. What, um, what is the strategy or, or what are your recommendations for how you evolve and, you know, deal with that existing CIPRI installed base as you move as well to packet front, front hall? Yeah, certainly, as, as you know, right, every network is different and every, you know, you have different side requirements. So Ericsson breaks it down in roughly three options. The first one is low capacity sites with low band radios. In this case, we take up to 12 10 gig CPRI radios, convert it into eCPRI, and then we take a, 20, a single 25 gig uh, eCPRI interface, right? And we just front haul it back to the hub. We have two form factors. We have a 19 inch form factor, uh, which is called the R608 radio gateway. And we also have an outdoor variant called the R308 radio gateway. Now for the high capacity sites where in addition to low band radios, I may have, for example, also um, higher capacity mid band uh, radios with 25 gig ECP interfaces. So in this case, we use a product called the Router 6673 Frontal Gateway and it converts it to 18 10 gig CPRI interfaces and then aggregates all those many 25 gig eCPRI interfaces coming from the massive MIMO radios. And then we aggregate everything into a single or more 100 gig Ethernet interfaces going back to the hub. And then finally, we have mixed sites. So in this case, we have, for example, still LTE and we have NR. And the carrier may decide, you know what, for my LTE traffic, I will leave the traffic connected to my existing deployed baseband. But the NR traffic coming from both the low band radios and the massive MIMO radios, I take all that traffic and then I connect it to a virtual digital unit. So what you will get in that scenario is that the router 6673 will have to act as a frontal gateway towards you know, the 
the low band radios. It acts as a local cell site route interconnecting all the interfaces and the compute platforms and the backhaul traffic together. And finally, it also has to act as a synchronization webmaster for the site, right? Still providing synchronization towards existing uh, city radios and also to the basements. Okay, so yeah, you, you brought up a, a couple of different technologies th that are involved. Um, maybe, you know, one of the things that tends to be confusing, we talk about eCIPRI, which is enhanced CIPRI, although a lot of people associate it with Ethernet because, you know, it largely was built to, uh, to work with Ethernet networks. And then we also have the concept of radio over Ethernet. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they can be confused. Um, can you just explain the differences between radio over Ethernet encapsulation and then eCIPRI and maybe, um, you know, what, what is best suited for, for what situation for operators? Sure. So ROE or radio over Ethernet, uh, it, it encapsulates CIPRI over Ethernet. So it's like running secret emulation, right, uh, of TDM over Ethernet. The advantage is that, in principle, it should work for all radios. And, uh, there are two challenges. First of all, it's book-ended, meaning that I encapsulate on the radio side, and then I need to de-encapsulate, of course, on the other side before connecting it to the base band. Second is that it provides minimum bandwidth reduction. So if you have a high capacity site, it may be hard to fit all the traffic right in a single 100 gig Ethernet interface. ESIP pre-conversion on the other end, the conversion is actually done in the radio domain. What brings us then to the disadvantage, it is radio and vendor specific. But the advantages are it's 60 to 80 times more capacity efficient because it scales with actual traffic, right? Uh, in contrast to RE, where it's always on, right? It's TDM over Ethernet. ECP, on the other hand, right? You only transmit when there actually is, when there's traffic. And it's a one-side solution, meaning I only convert on the radio side. And then I, I point the ECP traffic directly into the baseband or the compute platform where I have a virtual view running. Okay, right, good. So yeah, di different trade-offs, different applications maybe for each of those technologies. Uh, maybe to just take a, a little bit of a step back uh, mm -hmm. or kind of up, up, up a bit uh, looking down, as, as you talk to network operators, what, you know, about packet front hall, what do you hear back as the, the primary considerations and challenges uh, what what's on their minds typically when you have those conversations? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, to be frank, a lot of carriers are asking exactly these questions. Um, in fact, my colleague uh, David Sincrope is the work area director for the Broadband Form Access and Transport Architecture Group, and what they're doing, they're actually in the process of defining and specifying, right? Let's say the end-to-end -end architecture, right? What the best ways are 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 there for to build a network. So for 5G frontal transport, there are really five key considerations. You have capacity imports, you have the latency, the quality of services, synchronization, and finally, you need to have a radio knowledge. Okay, obviously we could probably spend a separate session on, on each of those. Uh, maybe maybe just to drill down on, on uh, synchronization is one of the ones that, that you brought up. We've been spending a lot of time at, at our different virtual events these days talking about synchronization. Uh, we talked about it last year at the 5G transport event in New York City. Um, so maybe, you know, a way to tackle it is if you think back over the past year uh, on mm -hmm. synchronization, what, what are the main uh, differences. What what's come up that's new, and how is that advanced? You know, specific to to packet front hall. Yeah. So sure, just to recap what we discussed last time, right? That's when with introduction of the new time division duplex 5G radios, you now need time and phase synchronization, and the requirement was between the radio and the time source, I have an absolute time maximum, uh, an absolute sorry, a maximum absolute time error requirement of 1.5 microseconds. That translates into 1,000 nanoseconds for the transport uh, network. Now, when you're building a packet frontal network, on the other hand, you now also have to take a look at the relative time error between adjacent radios. So not just the absolute, but also the relative time error between adjacent radios. 
And with new functions such as uh, coordinated multipoint comp for NR, you're talking about a relative time error of around 100 nanoseconds. So that's a factor 10 times more stringent compared to the absolute time error. So when you're building a packet frontal network, it is really critical that all the equipment in between right meets or exceeds the Class C uh, synchronization requirements. Okay. Uh, and I know we're, we're, we're getting short on time. I'll just the last bit I'll, I'll end on is actually your last point about the considerations was on knowledge of radio. As True. we know, a, a transport network, well, not exclusively, but mostly is, is a wire. Certainly not a, it's generally not a radio network. Talk about back hall, mid hall, front hall. Ericsson obviously has a leading position in the radio business. Uh, kind of, you know, maybe make the case for why your radio knowledge is so important for the transport space where, you know, to, to be fair, a lot of non-radio companies are seeing opportunities to, to move in there. So why, you know, why, mm -hmm. why radio, why Ericsson for this? Yeah, so I think, again, I'm a transport guy in a radio company. So one lesson learned is frontal is really a time critical radio interface. So whatever you do with the frontal interface has a direct impact on the RAND performance. So you really need a deep understanding of how radio and transport interact with each other and what are the consequences. If you look at, for example, a race car, right? Will you get the same performance if you replace the fuel injection system? Uh, if you change the tires, the wheel, even the driver. In reality, it's an optimal tuned system with all parts working together for the best performance. And that brings us to 5G. 5G is all about performance. On top of that, 5G is constantly evolving and improving. So it's not just about ensuring that it works today, but it works across the whole life cycle. So from an Ericsson perspective, we use the so-called Ericsson radio system approach. And that approach takes a holistic end-to-end -end system approach where we look at the radio, the transport, the rent compute, the management, et cetera. And then we align the roadmaps and the features, and we also tune it as an end-to-end -end system. And that allows our customers to have a faster time to market and a superior performing network. All right. I like the car analogy. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, so that we'll, we'll close out here. Uh, but Michael, yeah, I want to thank you for your time and uh, your insights and look forward to seeing you virtually uh, this year at the upcoming 5G transport event uh, taking place in November. But uh, thanks a lot for your time. Glad to be here. Thank you.